welcome to uh, the series called Leadership in Real Life. Today I have with me Bala Subramanian. Bala, he's a futurist. He's a technology person with a tremendous amount of experience across the globe. He's worked in various countries uh, with some of the top technology companies. He's actually a visionary when it comes to technology. So, Bala, thank you very much uh, for uh, agreeing to be uh, the first one to feature in uh, Leadership in Real Life. Thank you, Ravi. I was just looking at uh, the concept of disruption. Mm -hmm. And we see so much of uh, talk about disruption that is happening uh, in this world. So, what do you think is the genesis of disruption? Uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm reminded of what President Nixon uh, called as a silent majority. And by silent majority, he implied that there's a vast amount of Americans that actually agree with this view, while the people that were uh, complaining were really a minority. And it was a beautiful way of portraying and characterizing what was happening at the time. In disruption, uh, much the same thing happens when you are accepting, when there's a vast majority of people that have accepted a certain way of doing things, uh, with all with the inconveniences and, others, and other negatives that come with it, and have just grown over time to accept it, until somebody wakes up and says, why do we have to do this? And that typically is the genesis for a disruptor with something called a disruption that comes about. When, when, when this happens, does it happen like a big bang or uh, does it really, you know, play itself out over a period of time? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, interestingly, uh, studying this across a number of different industries and, and instances, uh, you can see a few, few distinct phases of how this happens. Uh, so let's assume that the silent majority has happened and and a disruptor has come about, disrupting the normal and normalized way that things get done. And a disruptive, let's call it technology for now, a disruptive technology is introduced. Uh, the introduction of that, uh, you will find, follows, uh, follows a general characteristic, which is everybody is ignoring it. And, and it is in this phase, this is really the early stages of disruption, it is in this phase that you see something known as, broadly known as, the innovator's dilemma. So this is primarily the stage where everyone says, ah, this is not going to uh, do anything to us. So the, the big players, if you may call it, would be the guys who would just turn around and say, ah, I'm ignoring this. this there, there's nothing of yes. this kind. Or maybe the leader of one of these biggies has not even spotted it. Yes, okay. very likely. Okay. And, and <clears throat> And in fact, uh, let's call them the legacy or the incumbents. Uh, they are very likely to, uh, even if they spot it, uh, and if they have analyzed it, uh, their analysis will prove to them conclusively that there is actually more downside for them than upside, should, should they choose to adopt uh, the technology or the process that is getting disrupted. And, and so it will, more than them ignoring it, it will also reinforce the fact that they should ignore it. Okay. Because there's just downside, no upside in it. Yeah. And, and that usually characterizes what happens in the beginning. And that's the innovator's dilemma, is that the innovation that they think is phenomenal uh, is just not going to get any significant uptake. So where does the uptake come from? The, interestingly, the uptake comes from people who really want to disrupt that status quo. So in this stage, you will find that uh, the disruptors of the status quo will use the disruptive technologies to begin the process of disruption. So that's typically the first phase. If we move beyond this, this is when the innovators are saying, okay, we've got some early adopters that are themselves disruptors, and, and so how can we improve and enhance what we have to make that happen for them? Hmm. And, and so they're going to dramatically start improving usability uh, features and functions that are at many, uh, many instances 
significantly different from what the incumbents are doing. So it's almost like a parallel track, but with vastly improved economies, vastly improved functionalities, uh, and vastly improved quality of service that comes with it in a service business. So you're going to see that the business model is starting to evolve in the second phase, and it's going to evolve in a manner that runs very counter to what the incumbents are doing. It's usually the hallmark of the second phase uh, in, in disruption. Now, if you keep at it, then the innovator looks back and says, hmm, you know, I've reached a stage, this is kind of like a rear view mirror, uh, mm -hmm. and looking in the rear view mirror mm -hmm. and saying, uh, I really have to bring along some of the incumbents. So they start to look at, so why are the incumbents still using whatever it is they are using? And, and therefore, must be of value, and therefore, we must build that value into what we have. And the incumbents are the, you know, the, the big biggies in the market, and therefore, the innovators need their support to make their invention also, uh, you know, more marketable. Exactly right, and more widely, widely adopted, used. Widely used, yeah. So, uh, and in some instances, they may even need their recognition of it. Mm. So there's a lot that goes with it. And so they start looking in the rear view mirror to look at, this is kind of like uh, uh, when you have your own child uh, and, and you're doing what your parents did for you, one day you wake up and say, wow, I'm starting to look like my parents. Mm. And this is exactly that. So this is the phase that, that the innovator goes through uh, where they start to really believe they're looking like their parents mm. when they were laughing at it uh, when they were adolescents. So that's the beauty of what happens in this phase when things start getting retrofitted to accommodate legacy or accommodate incumbents. After this phase is over, uh, the whole process of reimagining it begins. Mm. And, and this phase is also often, you know, it's called the innovator's curse. Uh, because they have spent all this time, energy, effort in innovating something that is just phenomenally different from status quo and then taken it and evolved it to accommodate the status quo. And now, lo and behold, something else is, something else has, is reimagined that upsets that apple cart and, and just looks at it in a completely different way. And the cycle, the cycle will continue. Starts. Could you bring okay. this to life so, using the technology industry as an example? Oh, certainly. Uh, in fact, we are all living through, uh, even as we speak now, uh, this beautiful term called cloud computing uh, with, with all its uh, incredible attributes of everything as a service and so forth. So if you look at the genesis of where all this came about, uh, the genesis was in the early days of mainframe computing and, and how the mainframes evolved. And, and with that evolution of mainframes, was the silent majority getting created. And that silent majority was a lot of people frustrated with all the centralization, not just of computing, but of power and so forth, and, and themselves feeling disenfranchised from the mainframe community. And lo and behold, that gave birth to the PC server era. And the PC model of computing, and this, or the PC slash server, client server type model of computing, started to evolve. And when it evolved, the mainframe makers, immediate reaction was, yeah, okay, it's interesting, but uh, I think there are many people who famously also quoted uh, as, as having said that we, yeah, there's a market for 10 PCs in the world, and, and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and this is just common, this is just normal. In fact, uh, I'm actually reminded of uh, what Gandhi said uh, in this regard. Uh, and this quote was something like this, I'll paraphrase it. And he says, at, at first they laugh at you. Then they ignore you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Yes, <laughs> correct. So, uh, you know, I'm also reminded of a quote where someone said, I don't, I, I can't figure out why someone will need more than 64 KB memory. Exactly. Correct. So, right. okay. So it's common. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so what do the PC makers do? They look at it and they say, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, when I grow up, I might be a mainframe, but I'm not grown up, but I'm going to do what I started to do. And what is it that I started to do? I'm going to enable personal productivity to happen. 
And so they focus on really enabling personal productivity. Having met that goal, they say, sometimes personal productivity involves collaboration and having multiple people involved with it. So server, so multi-user group computing starts added on as a feature. That multi-user group is really nothing more than a server-based model. So a server starts to evolve out of it. Server is still so small that it is not a real competition to a mainframe. Uh, so, but, but the mainframe uh, makers start to wake up to it. And they say, hmm, you know, it's starting to get some attributes of what we do, but it's still nowhere there. Uh, but the use and the usage of this starts to grow. And when it starts to grow, the PC makers, server makers, uh, start to look in the rear view mirror and say, okay, you know, we're kind of sort of growing up to be that mainframe like thing. What is it they have that maybe we could do that makes us more like them so that those guys will start adopting us? And, and the first things that come to mind are qualities of service, such as reliability, availability, scalability, those type of things come into being. And, and so they start to incorporate those features. And when you start to attack quality of service, now suddenly this computing paradigm becomes very appealing uh, in a large enterprise context for smaller to medium work groups. And so it starts taking root in the incumbents. And as it starts taking roots, they start, the PC server folks start building more and more features to make it more and more mainframe-like so that the adoption can grow and increase. And that era flourishes. And then somebody says, wakes up and says, okay, uh, so we now have created two legacies, the mainframe legacy and the PC server legacy. Maybe it's time to reimagine why should they both coexist or exist and so forth. And so the reimagination of all of that is cloud computing, where you take this and say, well, all this started to improve personal productivity, but the whole concept of the mainframe was around enabling and as a service model and an on-demand model but with capacity kept in-house. Why should capacity be kept in-house? Let's keep it in the cloud somewhere and enable that as a service model with all the attributes of, of enabling personal productivity and work group productivity on the cloud. If I take this and, uh, and, uh, and, and look at it from, say, another industry, let's take uh, the uh, taxi service uh, industry and we're seeing uh, Uber uh, or if we're from an Indian uh, perspective, I would say Ola, mm -hmm. actually disrupting the market. So what stage are we seeing right now uh, in this industry? And because I'm just trying to see, okay, what other stages are left behind? <laughs> right, right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way of seeing this across industries, right? And the, the Uber model uh, is actually interesting for, for a couple of other reasons too, but uh, let's focus on, on your question. Uh, the Uber-like model came about, if you look at the genesis, once again, if we begin at the genesis, uh, automobiles are pro uh, probably the one asset that are vastly underutilized and yet depreciate over time and still we buy them. So most of us who buy them become the silent majority wondering this is a curse upon mankind but it's, it's what enables us to go. So, so we gotta do it and we do it. We do it, we actually make yeah, the mistake. Absolutely, every time I'm stuck in a traffic jam in Bangalore, <laughs> I'm wondering why the heck I got this car. Right, right. Yeah. And, we, and, and the irony is that <laughs> we make this mistake not once, but sometimes twice or thrice. Correct. And, and so we've become that silent majority. So what is it we really want? We want to get from point A to B, but we also want to do it on demand at our, whenever, at our beck and call, when we need it, it needs to be there. So think about the technology industry and, and what we discussed about, very similar, uh, the, the evolution of the need. And when that need evolved, there came a company that said, well, uh, let's look at the taxi industry initially because there's vast implications beyond. The taxi industry is there, uh, is governed by municipalities and towns and cities and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's ridiculously expensive, but, and the beauty of it is when you need it, when it's raining, you will never get one. <laughs> so it has all these attributes. Now, juxtaposed <clears throat> with it are a vast majority of cars that are sitting parked somewhere. It could have been used 
but not used. So that's the dilemma that you look at this and so, so somebody like an Uber wakes up and says, hmm, why not take this vast majority of unused cars and put it into use and create a service uh, through which somebody can say, okay, I'm available, I'm free, I'm willing to drive and, and by the way, uh, set a mechanism for adjusting rates so that it is equitable to the driver and maybe not necessarily to the municipality that governs it and so forth. So the beauty of that system, the new system that is evolving is it not only gives you the convenience of a ride when you want it at your convenience, but it pretty much guarantees you it's going to be at a lower cost than what you can get elsewhere. It's almost a guarantee. So it's disrupting or not just the uh, service as it exists today, but it's also disrupting any governmental controls that uh, would may be there, which we don't know, but somewhere at the back of our mind that has already been built in and the, and the costs, are, our costs are being uh, built in. Correct. So it's challenging that very model. Right. So cost so, and inefficiencies. Both. Correct. Cost and inefficiencies. So which means that uh, there is going to be possibly the next stage of uh, rethinking because I'm already seeing a whole load of people beginning to accept right. the model. Right. So Uber has gone beyond uh, the stage of will people accept my model. They have already seen that people are accepting the model. Right. So it's now the question of now looking at trying to see how to retrofit the, uh, yes. the biggies. Yes. So it's yeah. still not there. Still so not there. It's in the second stage where it has vastly improved its service. So if you see, it started to offer Uber Pool. It's offering higher classes of service. And so you can now pick which class of service you want. Do you want to pool your drive? You want to use an economy car? You want to use a slightly better car? Or you want to use an SUV? So all those classes of services are being built in. And, and what they haven't necessarily done is, is reimagine, looking back in the rear view mirror and saying, how do I bring the taxi industry along? Hmm. So they have just embarked on that stage. And, and as you know, uh, many of these services are negotiating with municipalities and city governments and others to find that equitable way of moving forward. So they're kind of in the third stage, I would say. That's a, that's a nice way to draw a, a parallel in terms of how the disruption is going to happen. So disruption typically uh, doesn't happen in a big uh, bang. It actually has its own uh, stages and takes time and gives time for people to look at it, get a feel, try and start figuring out uh, how it impacts our industry and then hopefully move move into it or be lost uh, exactly. in the race. And that's what we are seeing a few companies uh, who, are, who are losing out in the race. But the time that each stage takes, I would believe, would be different from industry to industry. Some may be just too short a time frame for people to uh, get adjusted to and therefore they lose out in the race. Am I correct in that understanding? Very true. So mm -hmm. the time is a function of, of a number of factors, but most commonly uh, it is regulatory and those type of uh, impacts that, uh, that exist, that are there in the current system, impacts how long that phase lasts. Okay. So, uh, so interestingly, if you look at uh, the book industry, when Amazon came about, it took them about roughly 10 years to disrupt mm -hmm. the status quo. But they did in 10 years. You're now seeing not just books, a lot of stuff getting bought on the likes of Amazon and so forth uh, around the world, many other similar sites around the world. Uh, it didn't take them a lot. Why? Because there was not a lot by way of regulations in that industry. Uh, the more regulated an industry is, the more the incumbents and the external parties regulating them uh, have vested interest to maintain the status quo. And, and so those are usually you're going to see uh, a slightly elongated phase two. Mm -hmm. And, and once, once you see that slightly elongated phase two, then slowly, gradually, the regulators wake up to, well, this is not so bad, is it? Cloud computing is a great example of that, right? We saw the PC server era last 20, 25 years. Right. Uh, and there was a lot of vested interest in it. 
and slowly regulators around the world are waking up saying well, cloud computing is not so bad for banks for example correct and and so now you're starting to see the shift uh, in the banking and financial services industry moving more and more into the cloud so Bala, it's been great talking to you and I thank you once again for accepting uh, to have a conversation in this series of uh, leadership in real life and actually being the first one to come on into this series. So thank you. Thank you, Ravi.